You like it? 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 You like Oh, what's in the other? Let me see. Yeah. What's in the other? Subscribers? Yeah. Oh, I'll let you have it up close. Problem over close. Fuck it. How's the. Oh, we're broadcasting, so. Sure. Oh, not even mine. It's not too small. Yeah, there's like a 30 second delay. Oh, really? So you guys all crowd around there. Yeah, they're recording. Grab my own dress and those. You, you can all watch it. You can all just sit in the upper yeah, order if you like and watch it from there. You could hear us a laugh. I mean, wonder why for thirty seconds. Split into other rooms. Like a lot of speakers will try and like, hey, can the people upstairs give us a signal? And he on stomps and. You just, you just arrived on the screen. Right, have I read this a long? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> long thirty seconds. Right, cool. Let's get to on the road. <laughs> okay, so this is an experiment too many people can put in here. Um, um, so welcome to World Rail for June. No, we're in June. Um, Quick housekeeping, toilets just through the kitchen. Um, exit is the way you came in. Um, there's no other way out. Uh, <laughs> behind me. Um, so here we've got in round first, we're going to do, um, he's going to do chef, then we're going to have break pizza, uh, which my work optimal workshop is currently sponsoring um, on the drinkies. Um, and then we're going to come back for notices. So we, we forgot to do notices last time until part way through, and it actually seemed to work better. So we're going to do that part way through. So if you want to stand up and say, hey, we've got a job, or I'm looking for work, that type of thing. Um, and then we're going to do Docker with Joel, and then Nigel's going to do Client 66. Um, so probably about an hour and a half for life, I think. Um, so yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, oh, let me know if it gets too hot. It got ridiculously hot last time, and I forgot to do anything about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my topic is going to be uh, infrastructure automation with Fossil Ship. Um, so, this is uh, so this is about me. Um, I work at Quick HQ, and I've been a sysadmin since 2001. Um, it basically started because there was a website that I liked, and um, it started getting way too many hits. It got kicked off. Um, I was running it, and I started managing a server. So that's the segment, but probably didn't start right up until, until 2003, where I actually did it for professionally. Uh, I'm not a programmer. Uh, I'm not a real Ruby developer or a real developer. Um, and this tool for the job, uh, up until about a year ago, for me, was writing bash scripts. Uh, with some PHP thrown in, so procedural stuff. Uh, but what happened after I started with um, PHP is that I think Ruby is better now. 
<laughs> so, change. Uh, so what is Cricket HQ? Um, Cricket HQ handles um, anything that's cricket related. So we do administration for governing bodies. Um, we do uh, we do scoring of the live games on mobile devices um, on iOS, Android. Uh, we collect uh, we collect the data and then we analyze that. We generate reports um, and then we make it available. Uh, and it is available for anybody um, who, who signs up with us. Um, it is free to sign up. Um, you can basically um, record your kids' games, um, or somebody can record your kids' games, uh, and um, that could be available for you. Um, so if you if you want to take him or her to their coach and get them um, professionally trained and see what they need to work on, they can see uh, wheels, um, wagon wheels, and other things. Uh, actually, remove the slide for that. So uh, wagon wheels and, and other things for it. So very good stuff. Uh, there's a sh social media that we have rolled out, um, so it's nascent, so it's still in development. Um, it's working quite well. Um, so for a, a product like this and a service like this, uh, there is challenges that come with it. It has to be reliable. It has to be scalable. Um, for me personally, since I'm a sysadmin, uh, for my, these are my challenges. Um, configuration management of the machines, um, infrastructure management, uh, security, uh, how the instances are provisioned, uh, what what happens, how we how we scale. Everything has to be um, done, and all the processes have to be uh, logged, um, and they have to be automated um, because we can't handle the scale. Sometimes we have to do otherwise. Um, OpsWorks is an application management platform, so you get your application that could be Ruby, Node.js, PHP, or some form of Java, um, Java applications, and you can host it on AWS Hopsworks, which is, uh, I would actually say it's a free hosted chef server. So if anybody has used chef server or puppet server, it's like that, but basically AWS takes the burden of scaling that, maintaining that, and using um, all of the ex extraneous things that you don't really want to do as a developer out of your hands, and they basically take care of it. Um, really good success story for this is Intuit. Um, they're a very big company, and um, they have done. Okay. Um, so shift is infrastructure is code. Um, all of your processes, all of your things that you have to do to basically bring your code online, you can script those. Um, you can version control them. You can test them if you want to. Um, you can clone them. So you make a web, uh, you make a zone. Uh, you have an infrastructure of load balancers, servers, and everything else. And then if you want to, you can clone it to another region because you have new plans popping up there. You don't have to worry about the fact that is it going to work or not because it worked elsewhere. It is going to work there as well. But it is all inside AWS infrastructure. So this is the part that is shipped. Rest of it is OpsWorks. We chose OpsWorks because we were having Capistrano uh, puppet and uh, Capistrano issues. We had uh, downtimes, um, and AWS OpsWorks at that time they were offering <laughs> uh, they were offering um, Unicorn. Um, do you want to have some mute? Some mute button on your phone. Oh, it's a Sorry about this. Worst possible way to start this thing. Okay. Um, so they had um, it's a unicorn based system, and we basically, if we just move to it, we could utilize their zero downtime architecture. So we just chose to go with that. Um, there is basically about 150 resources. Uh, what, what, by that, I mean 
servers and maybe some um, some things like memcache and Redis and all these other things that we have. So those and we can scale infinitely more with just one sysadmin. Well, not really infinitely more, but reasonably infinitely more. Um, and it is based on Ruby. So you could do all of the things that you do for your infrastructure with just a couple of bash, bash scripts to run at different stages of deploying your things. But why would you want to? Your Ruby developers. So it's Ruby. You would want to do it. Uh, Daniel Zollinger, he created the first instance of this. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it was back then. It was an older version of Ruby, an um, older version of Shift that was behind the Opsworks thing, um, Opsworks and uh, Shift server that, that they were running. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a lot more useful and, and up to date now. It is up to date to the latest version of uh, Shift. If you guys are familiar with it, or even if you're not, um, it is a lot easier to use now. But when you did it, it, it was uh, very bad. So this is what a typical. <laughs> so this is this is what your typical your typical Power App looks like, basically. Uh, firewalls, load balancers, uh, app servers, and MySQL. Uh, and this is what it looks like in AppSource architecture. Basically, these are just group, groups, and these are just named different. Uh, so the scenario is that you have um, brand new Rails app that you've made, and so the sysadmin has to deploy it. They go into AppSource. Um, right at the bottom there somewhere, there's going to be a button that says add a new stack. You add a new stack. You choose things like what the default availability zone of an instance is going to be, uh, then the region that you want it. If you have VPC you know, configured, if you want to put it that way, uh, you can configure that. That's space. Um, if you, um, and so, um, how many people use Amazon? OK, so lots of people. Yep. Uh, so most of you would be familiar with some of these things, uh, but if not, basically these are security things that somebody, uh, somebody in ops have to deal with. Um, you can choose the default operating system you want, and whether you want instant stores or uh, EBS-backed kind of disks, and things like what sort of permissions they would have, um, the machines would have um, normally. Um, anything that you would uh, think that a machine should have or specific server or stack of servers should have, you can configure it as a default. Um, then you add layers. Um, layers are basically like groups of servers. Um, you can have um, MySQL layers. You can have PHP layers. You can have Redis, um, Redis um, Mancash layers, uh, Rails layers, anything you want. Um, so basically, um, in here, what I'm doing is I'm choosing a Rails server, and I'm choosing the Ruby version I want to implement and what the Rails stack is going to be running on. Um, and down there, you can actually choose to use a load balancer if you want um, already, um, classic load balancer, to deploy with that Rails stack uh, layer. So, and after you have created that, you create the instance, the instances of the servers. So these are going to be your actual servers that are going to be running. You can choose three different types of servers. You can choose them to um, you can choose 24-7 servers. You can choose time-based ones that only run at certain periods of the time, um, depending on how you want it. Uh, and there's a visual tool you can use to do it. And you can use load balance uh, um, load-based ones, which are basically things that um, get um, auto scale um, that is useful for auto scaling up and down if you want to. Um, and you can choose the type of um, hard disk it's going to use. You can um, after that you would. And you would need to have a data store. So you can choose different types of data stores you want um, You want to use. Um, I'm choosing RDS, which is their software as a service MySQL platform. Uh, I'm just, when I go there, um, it, uh, in the same zone that I've created the um, stack, um, I get automatic, um, automatically some, uh, some of the existing ones show up. All I have to do is, OK, I want to use that one. And I have to put in the root details, and I will have to basically make them connect together. Once that's done, um, I would actually have to go back and uh, edit. Um, oh. uh, this, this is how. Sorry, this is how you create an, an application. So that, that specific application that needs to be deployed, um, you create the specific important information about about it. So you choose. The Rails environment is going to be going on. Uh, what type of application it is going to be? 
um, what type of data source you're going to be using. I'm not actually um, doing that here because I actually and I ended up doing it, um, going back and editing this so that I can use the uh, RDS instance. Uh, then you can choose what sort of a domain name you want to give it. That application is going to respond behind the ELB. And there I come back and I edit it and put the um, information about where the data source for um, this application is going to be. And then I spin up additional servers. And while that's actually happening, I can go into the ELB and see what the status of the machines are. Once they have actually come up, this green text that come up because they're responding to the health checks that is configured on the ELB. Um, and you go there. And it's, it's up. So behind that is recipes that are running. Recipes are instruction sets that basically tell um, the, the during the life cycle event of, of a stack or a um, instance, what to do. So once it's like the setup, uh, setup part is what happens after you provision the instance. So that the instance comes online, um, it starts to run through each of these things in series, and they run through and they perform certain tasks. Um, the configure event is what, what happens when you scale your stack up and down, or you make a, a, um, a change in the configuration. So what would happen is um, these things would get run when um, configuration change happens. Your, uh, your nodes, you, you scale up uh, um, horizontally, and so you need to change the configuration files for different things like um, memcache, uh, MySQL, you need to change those configuration files and all the other variables that go with um, managing that infrastructure, you can put in there. Um, if you want, you, uh, you can have your own set of cookbooks, which is basically, uh, you can have a cookbook is a series, um, a couple of related um, set of recipes. And uh, cook, um, you can, um, with Opsworks, you have the ability to just use your own existing scripts which basically cover the normal use cases for PHP, Node.js, and um, Java, and uh, Rails. But if you want your own custom ones to deploy Windows or something else you want to do, you can do that there. Um, it's not actually supported Windows, but you could probably hardware and change it and just get it running. Um, you can have custom recipes that run after the Amazon, ops, Amazon ones run. You can have custom ones that run for, um, you can have custom layers that basically have the minimum amount of these scripts running them, or you can have um, specific ones um, that you write um, that would run after. Ones. Okay. Um, with, with packages, if you want um, your application servers, they would probably need some additional. Um, dependencies that you would need to install through your package management tool. You can actually do a search and install it uh, without actually writing the recipes yourself. So you can have very low touch, uh, low touch systems where you just want to use a couple of uh, packages there and just the default ones. And we do actually have lots of stacks that use nothing other than Amazon books, books, which cover pretty much anything we need to do. Only the certain, only some edge cases where we need to be able to, be, um, we need to be in control of uh, a lot more things to we have our own set of cookbooks that control everything. So this is what the uh, recipe looks like. So the one before, there's SSH users. Um, this is what I'm going to explore with you guys. So this is this gets run on pretty much all the Linux servers. And there, um, that part, the first part is groups, group opsworks. So that's, that creates the user group opsworks. That's a resource. Group is a resource. And that's basically creating, telling it to create that, um, that user group on the system. The group resource, it actually knows, um, based on the system it's running on, um, what, what is the underlying technology it has to use to create that group. So if you're on Windows, it will use Windows, uh, Windows things to create that user group. If you're on Solaris, it's going to use Solaris ones. If, it's, if you're on FreeBSD, you're going to use 
PTSD is only professional to do this. Rest of it is pure Ruby. Everything in here is just pure Ruby. So this is a Ruby DSL. More Ruby. Um, there's lots of useful um, resources that you can use. Um, there's package MySQL do action install int. This is a very useful um, resource. All it does is install MySQL. If the package part, it actually queries the package manager on the system. On Windows, it's going to look at Windows things. On Solaris, it's going to look at Solaris things. Um, on Debian or Ubuntu, it's going to look at AppKit and see if there is MySQL available on the system. If there is, it's not going to install it. Um, there's lots of other resources like this, like file, directory, bash. Um, file does, you can create your, um, you can create text files or any other files you want with permissions and locations um, based on a template or without a template with just anything that you have beforehand, you have just generated content for and you can just pipe it into the file and you can write, write it as a text file. Um, directory, you can create directories. Permission, uh, put portable permissions in there. Bash, you can execute bash scripts. Uh, when I started uh, initially, all I did was just write bash scripts and just put bash in front and put it there <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I didn't actually need to do any sort of coding until about three weeks in where, that, where I actually needed to use file to create another file. Ruby, you can run, there's two of them. There is Ruby and there's a Ruby block. Uh, there's differences between those two things. Python, uh, these are basically in sim similar way to Bash. You can put code that actually get executed during um, different phases. Um, there's two phases of execution. First is where the resources get compiled, what used to be done, and then the execution phase where it actually gets done. So if nothing changes, nothing gets changed. Um, there's a template for generating com uh, configuration files. Um, based on whatever you're doing, um, you can have a template that says, okay, this is use that file and pipe um, variables into it. It's based on ERB, so most of you should be familiar with it. Cron is really useful um, if you want to do some cron jobs on the machine. Services is useful for restarting up services for different um, application services or whatever else is running on machines. So a few days later, um, I uh, deployed that application, showed the thumbs up. So a few days later, somebody says, OK, uh, that, that's really slow. So what I have to do is, and so the developers, next few minutes, they made up a cache store where everything's going to run really fast now. So I deploy another layer. There's a main cache layer. And there's one server there. I'm actually reusing one of the servers. So there's a multipurpose uh, server there. And for using uh, memcache, this is what you have to do. Um, in, in the gem file, you have to add DALI. Then you have to configure it to use it. Um, so the solution is, for me, as an, um, as an ops person, what I have to do is basically generate that file and just add it in and load it by initializers. So this is the file that I have to generate. And so there's two solutions to this. Um, you can use environment variables, um, something like Roku. If you guys are familiar with it, that's really this um, It allows you to use environment variables, and you can pass in some things like that. The uh, problem with that is that Opsworks, by default, doesn't actually have a um, environment variable solution there. So if there is community cookbook start there you can use to, to do it that way if you want to. Uh, or you can actually generate these values out of uh, node attributes. The node attributes come from the cookbooks themselves, or um, infrastructure key values, or custom JSON values that you pass in during the deployment commands or any other commands that you run. Um, the hooks that are available for you to basically generate an app. So you can do deploy based once, uh, so it gets run during deployment for any of the for the application that you're deploying. Um, so we get, these are basically Capistrano based ones. So similar to Capistrano, so that, that, that basically illustrates where they fit in. Before migrate runs, uh, before migrations, before symlink runs, um, um, this basically that's how it works. Um, the chef infrastructure one based ones, uh, these are the 
more nice ones. Uh, these are these get executed during the life cycle event of a specific um, instance. So you can um, so deploy runs will only run after Amazon Housebox has run its own deploy scripts. Then it's going to run your ones. Um, and the app fold, um, the folder the application folder you create a directory deploy and before we start you put that there whatever code the chef code that you put in there it will get executed as part of normal Opsworks um, deploy run. This is what a maybe what what a directory with all the cookbooks would look like. There's a um, directory called Dali. I, I would make it. This is what I would do. I would make a Dali directory or a Redis directory, rescue directory. Um, I would make a um, couple of folders. The attributes one is where I, I would put the key values for the um, platform. Um, so the, any key value pairing that I would need for deploying this script, um, this resource. Um, the Dali, um, this is where I would put the instructions, the recipes. And this is where I would put the ERB files that would actually have be the basis for the um, template for generating the configuration files. <coughs> Uh, the solution to that problem, we're, we're, we were doing, um, we added a layer of um, memcache servers, and then I would actually have to get all the variables from like what, what the machines are, the private IP addresses, and then pump it into um, the infrastructure code. This is how I would actually do it. Um, all I would do is just put a, make a directory, uh, deploy it in the application folder before restart, and I would just add this in front of it. What it does is basically collects all the servers um, with, the, uh, with the role memcached. That's the name of the layer. And then I would um, generate it. Um, I would use the template resource. That's the, um, that's the directory. Uh, current release is their directory, which is the one that is, um, that is being compiled right now. It isn't actually deployed. Um, it's been compiled, um, it's been checked out. And it's being general. Um, all, all of the preparations uh, are being done uh, to before the um, before the application is going to be restarted. So um, in that directory, um, I'm going to be uh, creating that YAML file. Um, I'm going to be basing it on the Dali.erb file, which is going to be in in the Dali cookbook folder, and I'm providing the user group and the uh, Oh, owner of the user file, um, file what is going to be doing the, um, the specific permissions for that file. Uh, I'm writing the modes for um, the chmod values there, and I'm going to be passing on the variables um, for, um, that, that is being expected in the ERB file. So the servers, um, I'm going to be passing in an um, array of where all of that, where it did the, ser um, did the search. Result of that search, I'm going to be passing it in there. Um, I'm going to be also passing in the application environment variable so that it could create a specific ins um, stanza of um, of the uh, YAML file. And the action is to create it. So it's going to create that file. And then, so that's basically it. So, I'm, um, so this is how Opsworld um, Ops Chef works. Um, most of the most of Chef is basically similar. Um, there's some slight differences. Chef, uh, just normal Chef, um, if it's a pool, um, pool model, so every 15 minutes, uh, client run is done, and infrastructure is brought online and basically made to look how you want it to look. With um, with Opsworks, it's more of a push model where you're actually saying that I want this is what I want, and you run it, and this is what you get out of it. Um, so the things that we have done, we have done automated deployment, so as soon as we do um, our, C, uh, our CI passes, it actually sends them out to the Opsworks to deploy. Uh, we have done um, release logs. So based on that, uh, we do also do release logs. So production and staging, they have their own logs. And based on specific events, um, so when, whenever a deployment is done, a uh, release email goes out to um, stakeholders. Uh, we get email notifications from there. Um, and we, uh, we have done general uh, automation. So any task that's already been done, um, it will automatically um, be moved into um, ready for review. So that's our um, QA people that are going to be jumping in. So the, the developers that actually don't actually have to log into 
cheer up other than just at the start of the day where they actually see what they need to do. Um, and we have done feature bunch uh, stack creation. So we can do um, one command and we can actually bring up the whole stack. Um, so for any feature bunch um, with all of its own namespaced um, address instances, uh, app servers. Uh, questions? So just saying, do you mean that you're, you don't do February, oh, no, your do. developers don't do it? Or? Oh, no, no, no. Um, so what happens is that the code review um, happens, and then it gets merged in. Oh, then CI uh, takes over. Um, as soon as that action passes, um, then we generate those things. So even before that, it actually has to pass the CI test before somebody does a pull request and goes through. So anything else? Is it purely a um, ship based uh, API in terms of AWS? Like they haven't got Puppet availability? No, they don't. Um, no, they don't have Puppet. Um, there was some talk that they would have, have it down the line, but I don't know what the status of that is. Uh, there is also request for it, but they have not answered any of the four emails. So in your experience, what's the downside of using uh, AWS other, Hotspots, do you think? Um, you lose some of the control um, because they are hosting the infrastructure for it. If you have uh, some specific need to use it with Rackspace, you can't use it. So that's what you lose. But most of the recipes, now there used to be a difference between Hotspots, what Hotspots offered, which was an older version of Share and what they actually were running. Right now, there isn't. There is almost a parity of all the features. Um, there are some differences, but pretty much all of it is covered now. Some things like Chef Vault um, aren't there, but you can you, you, you can just modify those existing community cookbooks a uh, little bit, and they will work. Um, and what I what I mean by little is very little. Um, you can get those. Um, information out from S3 stores if you want to. And you can basically bypass, pretty much use the cookbooks as is. Um, most important thing uh, for me as a sysadmin was that they, they implement search. Uh, doing that reduced code quarter quite a bit. Um, but uh, if, uh, so that was the most important part um, that they, they did manage to get done. Um, so it is almost totally where we wanted to be. So when you deploy a new version or a configuration change, do you just make new instances or do you change the existing instances? Uh, we can do both. Um, so we are working um, towards something called immutable infrastructure. So we don't actually change any infrastructure. Uh, anytime we need to, we just open up a new whole new environment stack and just point the ERPs at it. Um, so the load balancer added. So there's almost no downtime. So it's basically um, just disengaging the ELD and changing the ELD. We could probably just do change the um, we use RAP 53 as well, so we could probably just change the ELD values there and um, just create new ELDs. But to keep the um, keep track of all the logs, yeah. we don't uh, delete the um, ELD. So we keep reusing the same one. But we can probably um, move towards just eliminating that as well. So you do that even for application deploys. Yes, um, we don't not, not necessarily all the time. Uh, sometimes we do when we're spinning up uh, quite a big change. So we would actually bring up the whole infrastructure up, um, put the modifications in, see how it runs, and maybe then we'll point the um, the load balances at the um, new, new stack. So so <coughs> even if if the changes that we make and if there are significant changes, we would do this. But there's no reason we actually can't actually do this for each and every single build. So we could do it, but it would increase the cost of it slightly. Uh, maybe not much, maybe ten twenty dollars more, but so ten twenty dollars is just on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you trying to say something? <laughs> I have another quick question. You know that configure step, which ran after the create step, which actually brings up the resources. Yep. Does that get rerun if you change a different instance? Like if you want all of your instances to know about the other instances, like your apps need to know about the main cache or something. Okay. Um, so uh, configure one. Uh, it runs anytime there is a stack-wide change. So if you add a new, uh, new instance on any of the other layers, it will get run for all of the machines. Um, and so you're not going to experience an issue where 
the other machines don't know that there's a new, new uh, app server that's up to accept the traffic or to do other things. So it is automatically handled for you. Anything else? Yeah, I agree, Christian. Uh, do you have any concerns around like giving away? Uh, obviously, you have to put your Git uh, SSH um, keys and stuff. Uh, no, you, you don't need to. Um, you, you don't. No, we don't. We don't give them uh, our Git. Uh, we can give them Git read access if we want to, which is what uh, what they have. Um, but we don't use our own personal ones. So there's an application deployment one. Uh, if you want, you don't actually have to do that. Um, are you using AWS at the moment, or some uh, other no, cloud? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, if if you are putting any of the data on AWS servers, so you know that you are compromising because they know what was on their machines. So, after that, whatever you do, you have to be aware of that, um, and from that point afterwards, uh, you have to know what what, what are you doing. So if you're already giving them access, uh, giving them the source code to run, and you have already compromised some parts of it, it's really not much of a stretch to get them um, yeah. get a read access so that they can actually deploy. You can use other ways, um, other ways. So you can give them um, a URL, HTTP URL. Uh, you can give them S3 um, S3 access to get the files. You can give them SVN access, or Anything up, um, that's, that's basically it. What about in terms of like defining uh, custom uh, configuration files? Because obviously, like a lot of stuff you leave out of your actual Git repo because yep. it's sensitive. Yep. Uh, session keys, for example. Yep. Um, how would you set them up using? Okay. Uh, what we do usually is put that in OpsWorks. Um, we can get, get these things configured so that OpsWorks doesn't actually. Um, we can configure uh, permissions on S3 uh, um, files, and we can uh, we can configure because this is Ruby. Um, it's only about three lines of code to get an item from S3, so you can use that and then basically store the item um, on S3. Uh, restrict permissions to certain instances, certain um, certain your instances. Right uh, we create the stack, there is an option so that you can use the instance um, role on it, and you can limit access to that specific S3 bucket to that specific um, set of servers who has that uh, permission. So they only those machines themselves, not AWS themselves, would be able to access it. In reality, what happens, we don't know if AWS is able to you know, bypass your security and just read if they want to. But they say they don't, and you take a <laughs> and they don't. So we, we put the permissions in there so that we can, uh, we know um, we can restrict it for other people, other accounts that can't access it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, on that note, I've got a question from the internet yep. from people who are watching online. Yep. Um, how much do the default recipes leave you secure? I.e., how much do you have to learn about hardening, etc. So the default is good, or did you have uh, to do a whole lot? Uh, default is quite good. Um, I do some optimization around um, some of the other things. So some uh, sys, uh, sys of values, um, I, I, I would change some of them, um, maybe make them higher. Uh, the nginx one, there is um, some variables that it's uh, how big of a packet to accept and how big of a um, request body is you know, to accept or not. So those things are some of the things that I would maybe change. but. Uh, you can code them, and you do have the ability. If you don't want to use a specific part of it, what you can do is put your own directory that's called the same, and then you can modify it however you want. Opsport is going to honor your your cookbook changes over their own cookbooks. So there is a point where a con uh, where a convergence happens, where your um, default defaults get stacked on, uh, under your 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 changes or your folder names, and so. Whatever gets run is yours. Um, if you want to just maybe make a change on the Rails one, you want to use a specific Rails thing where you're adding an extra instance there or something else, um, you can run only your, you would run the rest of the stack would run AWS infrastructure code and only Rails ones are done in the, your changes. You can make it so that you only change one file. You don't actually have to do all of them. Uh, if you stack your folders, 
uh, when, the, when the convergence runs, it will only pick up that your own changes and everything else be part of AWS infrastructure code. I'll probably also say on that note that it really comes down to how particularly you are about configuring stuff. If you're just happy with them to install Ruby 2.1.1 and don't care about what patch level, then go with the default ones. If you care about having a bit more control over your environment, then that's where you're going to want to start doing your own stuff. Yeah. Cool. Is there any relationship between Elastic Beanstalk and Oxford? Can you tell Elastic Beanstalk to use Oxford? Um, so just I'm not sure about that because I haven't used um, Elastic Beanstalk like that. No, no. So no. Um, <laughs> similar kind of concepts, but different. Ben, uh, Ben's talk uses the, the whole cloud formation thing. It's basically like a little mini cloud formation Heroku wannabe sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, produces kind of cloud formation XML documents and that sort of thing, and also it's just, um, gives you a lot totally of separate. Yeah. Um, ben Ben's talk is like the precursor to Opsworks. Can I say all Opsworks are on yeah. Your gateway drug, it's a gateway system. Um, Opsworks was. Um, Plex, Plexical or something? No, similar? it's a, a Berlin based company that did a lot of. Uh, yeah, Scalarium. Scalarium. Yeah. Yeah. So it's integrated into Amazon then. Um, how many instances do you guys run under Opsworks? Um, right now I run about 70 ish. Yeah. Um, it really depends, and sometimes we have to scale up. So. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do with devs? You know, do they just hand build their uh, machines, or do you have any way to uh, um, get um, them uh, to automate this, it? This is what something that we're working on, um, but this is not, we haven't actually done it. So even if we do end up doing it, it will be two different um, things because right now what we, what the devs use is an Apple Mac um, MacBook, so they can't actually use the same thing to build their own infrastructure. So that maybe is something that we're going to be looking at with Docker. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Cool. OK, my call it quits this, so yep. the piece of them will be too cold. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Okay. I need a couple of helpers to dish out the awesome amount of people. <laughs>